How's it going guys? It's Cole from See Through Panel showing off Lobster Johnson Omnibus Volume 1 published by Dark Horse and retailing for $40. We'll get to the credits in a minute. This book does come with a dust jacket with nice art all over it. Here's your price tag on the inside as well. Not a big fan, but this one serves a purpose. At least it has art on it. Before we get too deep into it, I'm not going to be spoiling too much. I'm going to be talking lightly about the story mostly about the art and what makes a pulp story a pulp story, and then about the Mignolaverse, as it's called, and how this book fits into it, reasons why that universe is one of my favorite things in comics. So let's get to the credits page so we can talk about who is creating this beautiful book. As always, written by a combination of Mike Mignola and John Arcudi with Tanchi Zanjic uh, writing and drawing the very first story. Sebastian Fiumara on art with Kevin Nolan, Joe Cario? I don't know how to say that. Wilfredo Torres and Tanchi Zanjic. Colors almost always by Dave Stewart, except for when Zanjic colors himself and Kevin Nolan has to letter and color himself as a legend, and Clem Robbins lettering everything else. So the story opens with a one-shot story that I'll flip through as I... Here's the table of contents. As I talk about how this book kind of fits into the genre of pulp and why I think pulp is a beautiful genre for comics, why it works so well. Uh, pulp is a genre I didn't really know about until I got into comics, and it's one that I absolutely love, and I would kind of forgotten that I loved it um, until I read this story. It's been a couple years since I got really deep into that genre. <clears throat> Francesco Francavia's Black Beetle being one of the first pulp comics I read that opened my eyes to that world. And I think that Lobster Johnson in the greater Mignolaverse kind of landscape is a very small footnote and doesn't really doesn't really inhabit a large spot of that world, but it does fit perfectly into the alternate universe, uh, Nazi punching, witch killing, Lovecraftian monster sighting, kind of weird weird strange genre that Mignola has kind of melded into his own universe and I think that this book itself here the format of intro intro one shot five issue arc four to five one shots of varying styles and then another five issue arc is probably the most readable larger chunk of the Mignola verse that you can get into especially if you're familiar with the pulp genre or just just old school crime fighting is really what this is. Lobster Johnson is a vigilante hero. He uses a gun, he kills. He's going to protect his city, New York, from gangsters, monsters, zombies, monkeys with guns, foreign assassins, Nazis especially. He loves to punch and kill Nazis. Who doesn't? And it fits perfectly into an early 1930s, I think 1931 or two to be exact, um, universe that Mignola, I think, is really fond of because he always kind of comes back to that right around World War II era. And John Arcudi as well, just in terms of plotting and pacing, is a absolute wonder at um, character consistency, character arcs, and generally just... I think the thing I enjoy about his writing the most is his ability to carry a story for a long, long number of issues and have it all feel consistent, well-crafted, have a satisfying beginning and ending. Um, I wish he wrote more comics. I think he's absolutely incredible. Tanchi Zanjic, who is our opening artist for the first short story and our first five issues. The short story is The Empty Chair. The first five issues are called The Burning Hand. Absolutely perfect for this style of story. He's got a very clean, very clear style. Uh, very heavy inks on the outlines of characters. Everything's very instantly clear when you look at it, what's going on. Detailed backgrounds, but not enough for you to get lost in it. His character work is distinct. Uh, Dave Stewart coloring does not hurt at all in terms of readability and beauty. Um, Layout-wise, you want to keep it simple in pulp, I think, and everyone does that. Everyone in this book just is immensely talented at making a readable, fast pulp book. Uh, Zondrick's art is just glorious as well. The thing about a pulp book, in my opinion, that it wants to do is it wants to keep you reading quickly. Often as uh, comic readers, people that love art, at least like me, I assume many people are like this, you want to get drawn in, you want to look at the backgrounds, you want to look at 
How does his line work change from the foreground to the background? How does the coloring change? How is Zondrick laying down ink? How does that differ from Kevin Nolan, who's later? Um, are the layouts different from him and Kevin Nolan? Does Sebastian Fiumara draw these same characters, but in a different way? And how does that remain consistent, even if it's two different artists? Things like that. Pulp, though. Pulp wants you to go panel A, panel B, panel C, panel D, turn page. Panel 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, turn page. Like, it wants you to go. It's a breakneck pace. This book is about fighting crime, explosions, gangsters, punching Nazis, a monkey with a gun. Uh, it's about so much, and it wants you to just read, because it is quick. There's never too many dialogue balloons. This is probably the most dialogue you're going to see on a page. It's just ridiculously fast. Okay, I lied. There's actually way more dialogue in the beginning than I thought. It wants to be quick. There's often silent panels. Mignola himself is a huge fan of the tone-setting panel that kind of shows off a room and a little insert before you see the actual room. Zanjic not so much, but some other artists later will adapt that kind of storytelling technique. Um, tons of big onomatopoeias and sound effects. Uh, there's going to be two to three fight scenes per issue. There's When there's not fight scenes, there's going to be intrigue. There's going to be gang warfare or hinting at it. Maybe some mysticism as well. Uh, a character from the larger Hellboy universe makes an appearance. Not really a spoiler, considering he's on the dust jacket uh, right there. Um, and I think that the, this book is extremely well done in the sense that it is peak pulp. It is peak pulp comics. I think comics are one of the best mediums to do a pulp story in because of the nature of storytelling and art and things like that um i i don't have a ton of evidence i'm not like a expert on the genre or anything but i think it works super well especially inside of the mignola verse where you're already in this alternate universe you've already got a ton of information if you're an experienced reader which you do not have to be um i'll get into that in a minute and it's just the tone wise it fits right in even though hellboy is about fighting gods and Lovecraftian monsters and literally going to hell and emerging from hell and the end of the world. This is about a man fighting gangsters on a city street and trying to evade the cops. And it works so perfectly. It blends right in. Uh, the way it intertwines with the greater Mignola verse is a spectacle, really. I think the whole... I'll get into that now. Let's get into that now. This takes place in the Hellboy universe, right? That doesn't matter at all. You do not need to know that. It won't come up. If you are already familiar with the Hellboy universe, you will be fine. You'll be rewarded for having that knowledge. It'll enrich your experience. But it does not need to be there. This could be a solo story with just this character in this world that was just for this book, and it would be equally as good, I think. Uh, it's just it's elevated a bit by that knowledge that you already have by being a reader of Mignola's previous work. Um, it's really unnecessary, but it, it's, like I said, it elevates the experience. So that I think I love. I love that there's just all these little pockets of the Mignolaverse. Over here you've got gods fighting each other. Over here you've got paranormal societies and uh, conspiracy theories. And over here you've got Nazis being punched all the time, which is a great little corner. And it's it's just so wonderful that something like this exists. It's one of the reasons I think I've stayed in love with comics so long is because throughout my entire comic reading experience, basically since the first year of reading comics, um, I've read Mignola books and they always make me happy and they always satisfy a different craving or a different genre I wanted to read. So this is where things change. So the reason this book is so well paced, I think, is because we get this opening, opening story, Tantri Zanjic, one shot, beautiful way to get into the world, know the character, Five issue arc, Tantri Zanjic, no big change, but we're going longer on the sh on the story. We get out of that arc. We're probably a little tired. We put the book down for now. We probably read that whole arc in one sitting because it was so breakneck and awesome. Come back. It's a one shot, but it's by Tantri Zanjic, so a different format, but same art. And then one shot with Kevin Nolan, same format, different art, a lot different. Um, if you know what you're looking for. And I think that's the smart thing, because then we start to get into more one-shots, different artists, different artists. And then the next five-issue series wraps around, comes around, and it's not Tanchi Zanjic, it's Wilfredo Torres. 
and we go right in because we've already been changing artists. We've already seen Fiumara and Cario. I, I'm not sure how to say that. I wish I could. I really wish I could. And we've seen all these artists, and we're at this point we could we'll take anything. All of it's been fantastic. And then we get into Wilfredo Torres for a five issue arc, and we are in. We are just in. And I think it's pretty genius how they set it up. I think it's probably one of the smartest things they did with this book is how they kind of introduce these different ideas independently, but in a in the proper order. So I'm going to fixate on Kevin Nolan here because I've always wanted to have more Kevin Nolan in my collection. I never do the work to look up what he's in, what kind of books can I get, what is his experience. I don't know what his bibliography is at all. I know I saw some Doctor Strange art once, <laughs> like years ago, and I fell in love with Kevin Nolan's art, but I never got too deep into his comics. So I just happened to buy this book because of it's I like Mignola books, and he's in here, and it is an absolute treat. It is so classic feeling in its line work, and it's um, and to actually honestly the whole structure of it, but the coloring he does himself, he's doing everything on this besides writing, and the coloring's so modern. I I'm I'm really surprised and impressed that uh, it just looks so. It could be in any. Well, no, it couldn't be in any comic from today. It could be in a really great comic you picked out on the shelf today. It could be on the best book of that week. It could be on that shelf, and you wouldn't bat an eye. And this is a brand new artist who just came in. Uh, he's absolutely killing it, but it's so modern is my point. Not a brand new artist. No brand new artist could be this good. But he looks so modern. And the story fits right in. Fighting crime. Probably what looks to be like... <laughs> Zombies driving a car is actually just dead bodies in a car, but it's you would expect they might really be zombies joyriding because of the Mignolivers. Um And I won't say much about the story, but grim and gritty. Like I said, with Zonjic layouts, keep them clean. Maybe some insert panels for world building or to set the scene. Keep everything nice and clean. Backgrounds, he likes to keep it pretty bare when he needs to. So... He could do really, really fine details like this face here, but next panel, you don't need the background. He's getting tackled. Nothing matters besides that he is in the air being tackled. Is he close to the ground? Is he still standing upright? Don't care. He's being tackled. Next, we're drawing a background here. There's a door in the scene. Nothing else is really drawn out. You need to know he's going through a door. He's being shoved through a door by one guy into another guy. That's what you need to know. That's what's on the page. Next, you can see he's on the ground because of this uh, coloring here. This is in the white background, nothing, completely blank. Doesn't matter, we know he's on the ground fighting, grappling on the ground. And then from there, my point being, he draws what is necessary and what makes it the most readable. If he put, if there was a really dense uh, laboratory background here with shelves and all sorts of trinkets, Jeff Darrow style, trinkets all on the shelves, maybe a little picture of the guy's family, uh, some crazy Lovecraftian statue thing right there, doesn't matter you're not going to linger on it because you're going tackle on the ground, shoot the gun, stand up. It's, it's what's necessary for the art, for the story, for the progression of the story, for the pacing. So I think that's so well done for every artist in this book. And then you open up, find a new room, something crazy is in the room. He's going to draw the hell out of that. He's going to draw every little thing, little trinkets on the table, tubes all over the place. There's that door we went through. There's the guy we fell into. That's what happens when he needs to do it, because you're supposed to linger on this scene for a moment longer. And all these artists do it so well, and then they, the flow is so natural, because the writing is so consistent, the characters are so consistent, the art can change, but it still really feels like the same world, the same place, the same story. And I think I'm just really impressed with that as a whole on this book. Um, and in the Mignola-verse, this is Kier or Cario. I wish I knew how to... I should have looked that up. I'm sorry, Joe. Um, this is, his art is phenomenal. I don't even know if I've seen his name before, but I really thought it was something special. A lot more shadows. I love lobsters, orange lenses. I think that's a really fun character design choice. Kind of a monkey's paw type story. Here we get Sebastian Fiumara, who I absolutely adore, and I loved his Abe Sapien work for Mignola's book as well. Um... Yeah, and then we get through this, some uh, short stories, we get through them, and this one's a bit longer of a short story, and we get to Wilfredo Torres, actually no, 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 Wilfredo Torres, that's another genius thing I forgot, 
he draws the last short story. So you're on Torres art. You're getting into Torres art. You say, oh, this is a little different. Get through the whole story. You're, you're deep in it now. You recognize that you know what it is. And he's drawing the next five issue arc. So you're in the same place as you were before. You're already ready to go. Nothing's going to throw you off. You're exactly where you need to be for this story to unfold. And it's just so smart. And that's the thing about the Manuelaverse as a whole is it's all just so well crafted, so well, every artist is so well chosen. The writers know exactly what they need to put in to make it fit with the rest of the world, but they know how to make it its own story. So if you don't know the Manuelaverse, you don't know Hellboy's background, you don't know about the BPRD, you don't know who Abe Sapien is, you don't need to know those things. It's just the story that's in front of you, and it opens 30 other doors that you can go through into various corners of this crazy universe. And that's really the beauty of uh, Lobster Johnson and the Mignolaverse. This has been my TED Talk. Uh, <laughs> I, I went in just kind of wanting to review the book, but here I am. So I love this stuff. I'm probably going to be reading some more of my Hellboy books because uh, I got a brand new bookshelf and I'm going to fill it with uh, Dark Horse books. So thanks a lot for watching, guys. Peace.